I love you guys. A few weeks ago, I asked you guys on my Insta story if you were interested at all in knowing a little bit more about my health and fitness regime. And to my surprise, there were hundreds of you, like holy crap, hundreds of you who wrote back interested. This has taken me a little time, but here I am to finally give you kind of my insights on health and nutrition. You've probably heard this a lot before, but there's really two sides to health and nutrition. It's diet and exercise. And for me, the most important part of it is actually diet. Uh, you hear there's so much confusion about diets right now. There's so many fad diets and like so many conflicting arguments on what's right, what's wrong, what's toxic, what's not. Um, in the end, I have a pretty basic diet, I guess. Like it's nothing crazy. I'm not vegan. I'm not vegetarian, I'm not paleo or keto or paleo, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I eat a pretty standard omnivore diet, but I make sure that I watch out for some things. Now I don't claim to be a guru. I'm not a super athlete. I feel like I'm an average guy who's just been able to maintain his health into his thirties. Uh, I know that's still relatively young, but I feel like for my age, I still feel great. I think I look good. Like I'm just really happy with everything that's going on right now. So, and I'm just really excited to, to share what I do to do what I do, I guess. So without further ado, let's get into it. First of all, let me show you where I'm recording this from because it's pretty fucking cool. Okay, this is in Sulawesi in Indonesia. And we're kind of staying on these floaty cabins and it's sunset and it's absolutely beautiful. Okay, throughout time, there's been two sayings that have really stuck with me and kind of hit home in their simplicity. One is that abs are made in the kitchen. And that pretty much means no matter how much you work out, how many sit-ups you do, that it really comes down to what you eat that matters. And the second one that I really like is food can either be, what was it? Food can either be the most safe, pure form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. There's so many schools of thought when it comes to what should be eaten and probably the most vocal contingent is a vegan contingent. But in the end, I really don't think that there is one diet right for everybody. Everybody requires different things. And I think that if there's anybody saying that this diet is right for everybody, it should be a huge red flag. I think it really kind of depends on what your the makeup of your gut flora is, and everybody has a different one. Some people do great as vegans, some as vegetarians, um, some as raw only. Um, omnivores do great uh, for some people. And really what's surprising is there's actually some people who do really well on a carnivore diet. Their body works optimally just eating meat and salt. That's all to say that there's just such a huge difference in what humans can process, um, and so there is no one right way. In the end, you just need to listen to your body, and that is probably the greatest barometer. Besides getting all the vitamins and minerals you need, the for me personally, what I think is the most important thing is getting a handle on your blood sugar. No matter what your mix is, whether it's vegan, all the way to carnivore, it's really, really about your blood sugar levels and what that kind of extrapolates out to. Like, it's not just the blood sugar, it's the implication of that and the downstream effects of that. And that all starts with insulin. You probably have already heard of insulin, but it's always been in relation to diabetes, right? Insulin is actually a very important hormone and all of us have it and it serves a very important purpose. We only hear about it in diabetes because that's kind of when it's become a problem, when it's already over the deep end, when it's too late. In simple terms, insulin is a hormone that is responsible for taking glucose out of your blood and into your cells and locking it there for short-term energy use, about six to 12 hours. So when you eat, your blood sugar goes up, AKA blood glucose. Your pancreas then releases a certain amount of insulin and it releases as much as it thinks it needs to absorb absorb all of that glucose into the cells. Over the next several hours, your body will use that glucose for energy. Well, you know, just to stay alive and to move and to think and all that stuff. The problem is that insulin is actually a fat accumulating hormone. And a very direct example of this is when diabetics have to inject insulin into themselves to supplement their own bodies. There is a fat deposit that starts happening at the site of injection. That's a very direct result, but it has a lot of other fat accumulating property. First and foremost, it intercepts with other important hormones and enzymes like uh, hormone sensitive lipase, leptin, and glucagon. Lipase is an enzyme that actually signals fat burning. 
leptin is a hormone that is the satiety hormone. It makes you feel full. The problem is that insulin interacts with it and cuts off that signal. So you're at risk of eating more if you have a huge spike in insulin. And glucagon is a hormone that undoes what insulin was supposed to do. So insulin is supposed to take glucose from your blood, put it into your cells, and then glucagon pulls it out of the cell as your body needs it to burn energy. Insulin blocks the properties of glucagon. So basically, if there's a spike and then there's a subsequent crash, it's because your body can't access that energy in time. And on top of that, your body then signals hunger so that it can try and recapture some of that blood sugar. It's, you have it, it's just locked away, but your body needs an immediate supply. So it triggers hunger and there you go, you're kind of in this vicious cycle. I'm not arguing against insulin as a blanket statement. It's more just a problem if it's there's like constantly spiking and unfortunately our modern diet is flush with foods that do that and at the top of that list is simple refined carbs sugar and alcohol you really want to avoid those because they're just going to send you on that roller coaster of up and down take a look at this glycemic index chart if you look at the numbers there you see the ones that are the highest numbers those are the ones that are going to trigger the most insulin response those are the ones that are going to get sugar into your blood the fastest and thus give you that huge insulin spike as your pancreas tries to keep up with this sugar bomb you just unleashed on your body wow i just turned around what the fuck to tie it all together this is an issue about rate of release if you have something that releases blood sugar slow in something that has a lot of fiber or low sugar content, um, like an orange, for example. When it's a whole orange, it has fiber. When it's orange juice, it doesn't. Uh, that slow release is going to allow your body to release the right amount of insulin. And then it can, your insulin can store the energy it needs, and then your other hormones can do their job, like leptin and uh, glucagon. So that brings me nicely to the next point, which is fasting. And those same principles that apply over from insulin and sugars and carbs and all that kind of world translates over and why I'm such a big believer in fasting. Our food environment today is so different than when our bodies were evolving. The concept of breakfast, lunch, dinner is, is there's no biological necessity to that. That is just a, just like society and culture over time has kind of dictated that this is what we do. We're in constant cycle of eat, hungry, eat, hungry, eat, hungry, but we barely even touch the, the edge of hunger before we go searching for food. Um, if you think about it, if you guys have ever had a golden retriever, you'll know that if you leave an infinite amount of food out for the golden retriever, they will eat themselves into obesity and eventually death. And we're kind of the same way where our brains and our bodies aren't connecting in the same way. Our brains are wired to eat as much as we can because back in the day, we didn't know when the next meal was gonna be. Except now we do, it's, it's gonna be in four hours and it's gonna be an extremely energy dense cheese pizza. And just like that, over a long, long period of time, we just eat ourselves into mad health, mal health, and eventually death. So what's fasting? It's basically just going a long period of time without eating. And this is eating nothing and drinking nothing with calories in it. I know what you're gonna say, but I'm gonna be hungry. I need to eat, <laughs> like, I'm so used to my three meals a day. Stick with me, it's actually not that hard. The most common form of fasting nowadays is intermittent fasting, and you've maybe heard it everywhere. It's actually, a lot of people are talking about it. And that's pretty much where you go 16 hours of no eating and then eight hour eating window. Uh, you can also like push that 16 hours to 18, 20, 22 of eating and no eating. Um, there is 24 hour fast, there's 36 hour fast, there's week long ones, but the most common one is intermittent fasting and that's the one that I do. So the main premise of this is just to give your body a break, to give it an opportunity to do what it was designed to do, which is not to be in a constant cycle of digesting and storing and energy digesting and, and storing. It's, it's to digest and store sometimes and also to switch over to this other form of energy burn, which actually feels very clean. It's a clean form of energy burn. So remember when I said that you could hold a couple hundred grams of energy in your, in your muscles and your liver in the form of glucose? Well, after about 10 to 12 hours, those energy stores are completely exhausted and your body is just forced to turn over to this form of ketosis uh, to burn fat for energy. 
this gives your body a chance to rest and actually do a couple other really awesome things. One thing it does is a thing called autophagy, which is an internal house cleaning where your body will consume and devour weak and damaged cells, destroy those and use those for energy. You will get your insulin sensitivity restored. Once your insulin is low, your body will be able to better pick up those signals the next time you eat. Therefore, you won't have to release as much. Another great side effect is you'll just naturally eat less. Just because by the factor that you have an eight hour eating window, you can not eat as much as you normally could and your stomach actually starts to shrink a little bit. And so you, your portion sizes when you do eat are so much more healthy and manageable. And it's actually really not that hard. Like when my friend told me about it, I scoffed at the idea and I said, ah, oh, just these more fad diets. And I, you know, I never followed any diets. And then I started looking into it and I started seeing all the health benefits to it. And then I tried it and it's really not that hard. You can just kind of ease your way into it. Uh, and you can take, you know, some things in the morning to, to satiate yourself until lunchtime. I also found that in the mornings, after a long period of time without eating, I just had the most amount of energy. It was clean. It was, I don't know, I just felt very clear mentally and physically I was on top. It was great. So by fasting, you're giving your body this, this opportunity to kind of rest and recover and, and turn over to this other form of energy consumption. And I feel great. And I think that it's a really great system. I'm not a professional. I, I do think that you should look into it. Uh, you can just look up intermittent fasting on YouTube. You'll see some great videos. But this is what I found. Like some of the other great benefits that I've been reading about is there is an uptick in HGH, human growth hormone, which helps stimulate the growth of muscles, which is kind of a double whammy. It means that the more muscles you have, the more uh, glucose that you can store in them. And then you're not going to have that spillover effect where any extra glucose that's in the blood needs to be converted into fat. Now fasting means just that, not consuming anything that will trigger a metabolic response. Now that is juice, or soda, or food, or anything. Um, anything that will trigger a metabolic response. Basically you're really narrowed down to water, salt, black coffee, no sweeteners, no milk, nothing, uh, or green tea. So this is how I do it. This is what my day looks like when it's an intermittent fast day. I wake up at around 7.30. Uh, I get ready at home, all that stuff. At 8.30, I go to a cafe to do some work. At the cafe, I order a, an Americano, uh, which is just a black coffee, essentially, and I don't add anything to it. Maybe I'll add a splash of salt. Don't knock it till you try it. It's actually pretty good. At around 11.30, I get home. I make myself a little glass of salt water. Uh, when you're intermittent fasting, you're using up more salt, and it, salt is a very, very necessary electrolyte for the proper use of your muscles, for the proper use of your brain, for the proper use of your heart. It's a vital, probably the most vital mineral. Um, and it doesn't break it fast. Uh, I go to the gym and then right around one to two o'clock is when I have my first meal. And that's when my eating window opens. I have my first meal at one and then I continue to eat throughout the day, whatever I want, as long as it's not a high glycemic index food, um, kind of whatever I want until I have a rather large dinner at eight or nine and then I'm done and then I just have water until the next day and start that coffee and salt water again in the morning that's it so this scenario gives is is fasting for about 16 to 18 hours this gives me a window of like six to eight hours of being in a ketosis or a fat burning state I'm not necessarily trying to lose weight but I'm definitely not trying to gain weight but the biggest benefit I see is that when I'm fasting, I just feel a lot more mentally clear and I feel like I have more energy. And that's often why I work in the morning. I do my best work when I'm in this mode. Now my gym routine isn't actually all that crazy. I, I go, I try and go six days a week, which is a lot, but I, I don't spend hours there, maybe 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, I don't do any crazy like machines or anything. I just kind of lift some weights generally um, and just generally stay active. I take walks and that kind of stuff, sometimes hikes, you know, depending on the day or if I'm out here, I've been swimming a bit. Um, but in general, it's not any, it's not like some crazy, like, you know, P90X, you know, CrossFit type of routine. It's just being kind of conscious of when I eat, being conscious of what I eat, um, but not to a, like a really, really crazy extent. I still definitely have delicious meals all the time. Um, <laughs> let me rephrase that. I have a lot of delicious meals that are healthy, 
but I have a lot of delicious, unhealthy meals as well. I, I allow myself a little. And then I fast, which is really not that hard. And then some pretty, pretty moderate exercise. Um, and that's just kind of a pretty, I feel like it's a pretty easy and solid uh, routine. I feel great. Again, as I said, I'm, I'm in my early 30s. I feel a lot younger than I than a lot of people that I see my age. And, and I try and tell them, oh, like, this is what I do. And I encourage you to do it. Okay, so I recorded that video a couple of months ago, and as I was putting it together, I realized I had so much more to say, and I wanted to go more in depth, and then I just also wanted to write out some actionable steps. So I also, along with this release of this video, I'm also releasing this uh, PDF uh, that's just, it ended up being a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. I have just so much more additional information and uh, some steps that you guys can take if you want to start going down this journey uh, of just, you know, maintaining a healthy lifestyle. So there is a link in the description below and I'll take you straight to that.